produced, Mattel started putting together something to compete with it. Presenting in television. But then when it went through the roof, they said, okay, we, we got to do this. We got to come out with this. And triggered the world's first true console war. And television was so much better than Atari. We had stronger hardware, greater graphical power than the Atari. I find in television more sophisticated. They prevailed when others failed. When the video game industry collapsed in 83 and everybody got out of it in 84, and television survived. And television was the one game system that kept going. This is the spectacular story behind Intellivision. In the mid-70s, gaming is still in its infancy. The Atari came out, I believe, in 75 or 76. It uh, was not initially that successful. It did well. Um, it was popular with a lot of kids wanted it and everything, but it wasn't as popular as Nolan Bushnell thought it was going to be. I think they manufactured 800,000, they sold 300,000 the first year. The world's greatest arcade video games are now the world's greatest home video games. They're only from Atari. A company named Atari is key. After Space Invaders was introduced, and then everyone said, oh, I want to play Space Invaders on, on Atari, and then suddenly it just went through the roof. The biggest thing that Atari did was get computers in people's homes. Atari put more computers in people's homes than any PC manufacturer was even close to, by factor of a hundred or more, because they learned the idea of you sell the application and not a computer. But a challenger to the throne rises from Toyland. Well, when Atari was first introduced, Mattel started putting together something to compete with it. But then when it went through the roof, they said, okay, we, we got to do this. We got to come out with this. Mattel creates an electronics branch called Mattel Electronics and introduces the Intellivision to a test market in Fresno, California in 1979. And in 1980, it's ready for release. Presenting Intellivision, the home video system from Mattel Electronics. Propelling the industry's first big console war. For the first time in the video game industry, there were two systems at one time that were out there competing with each other. In television, the world's largest toy company battling Atari, bought by Warner Communications. Boom, it's going to be a big business thing, big stock thing. Ooh, what's going to be, what's it going to be? There's a growing library of in-television programs to involve every member of the family. And for families, it was no longer a question of, hmm, should we get a video game system? Now it was, hmm, which video game system should we get? And now the sales for both Atari and Intellivision went way up. And so, boom, they're going up. I'm back to pass. Go for it, Dad. You caught it. The competition just became really intense. The toy company responsible for Barbie doesn't take their new gaming system lightly. It was a more sophisticated system because Mattel figured that being this big prestigious toy company, they would compete with Atari by saying, Theirs is a little toy thing that you play some arcade games on. Ours is going to be a family educational and entertainment center. In television can change your family's life. We are going to have this machine that you will later be able to put a computer keyboard onto it. Available in 1981. And you will be able to put a modem on it. They were talking in 1980 about, you know, modem for the Intellivision to be able to get online and to get information and to do all this stuff. So they were really positioning it as this big family unit. It can change your family's life. The technology isn't cheap, but you get what you pay for. And so it was more expensive. It was $300 compared to $150 for the Atari. But they had this image behind it. The Intellivision was so much better than the Atari. And stop me now before I go on. The Intellivision, like now, if a hardware platform has a year to cook longer than its competition, every year there's a real advantage. So we had a stronger hardware, greater graphical power than the Atari. And the ColecoVision, which came after us, had some enhancements over us. So it was simply a moment, when is that stake? 
driven into the ground, and that's what the designers have to work with. The reason people liked the television more than Atari was that the graphics were better. It just looked better. But the Intellivision for its time was a very powerful machine. Mattel decides to milk its hardware advantage and brings in a celebrity to sell the Intellivision to the masses. And so instead of trying to position it as the big family center, they instead just started doing commercials where George Plimpton, who was known as a sports writer, came out with a television set with Atari showing Atari baseball, television showing in television baseball, and this was very radical for the time to directly show your competitor in a TV commercial. An aggressive marketing campagne ensues. Church Plunge said, Look at Atari basketball and in television. You can tell the difference. I think in television plays much more like real basketball. And it was brilliant to use the sports things because this was new. People didn't know video games that well. People hadn't grown up with video games. They were relatively new. Arcade games were still considered, you know, a new phenomenon. But everyone knew what a sports game was. If you try them both, I think you'll find the clear winner is in television. Compared to Atari's graphics, these were so realistic. And they capitalized with that. They had commercials showing how well their baseball games were to Atari's baseball games. So everyone could look at that TV set and look at that baseball diamond and say, that looks like baseball. We don't know what this Atari thing looks like, but it's not baseball. It was the sports games that immediately set us apart. And the comparison campaign pays off big. Immediately, the sales just started jumping once they started doing that campaign. That was in 1981. And very quickly, uh, Mattel was able to grab about 20% of the market. Mattel will need to do more than just step up to the plate if they want to bump Atari from that coveted top spot. But their next approach may be a little uncivilized. Sales of Mattel's in television are great, and a big part of that is due to a library of quality games such as NBA basketball, NHL hockey, Astro Smash, and Tron Deadly Disc. On the Intellivision side, I'll, I'll name some of our favorites. Uh, Astro Smash is easily just a game that is the most simple game in the world, but just completely addictive. It's just a gun shooting up, pew, 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 asteroids falling, that's all there is to it. There were three and a half million in television, so it was one million Astro Smash. Some of the other games we've had for Intellivision, Night Stalker, is a game that people after 20 years remember. One truly groundbreaking in television title is Utopia. Utopia was a game that Don Daglo did. I had gotten the idea from the combination of having been a junior high school social studies teacher and watching the movie Attack of the Killer Shrews. So I know that doesn't sound like it should go together. That's where the game idea came from. And Mattel wanted to have a diverse range of things in their line, and they took a chance and let me build it. The idea of Utopia is there are two islands on the screen, and in those days, that's all you got were nice, steady things on the screen. And your job is to run your island in the way that makes your people happiest. It was a game where you had to figure out how to plant crops on your island and keep your people happy and all of this, and it really was the first sim game. You know, people have referred to it as Civilization 0.5 because it really is kind of the, the beginning of all of those things. All of these games now with Civilization and with SimCity and The Sims. It really can be traced back to this Intellivision game that Don created back in 1981. And for the men and women who create these Intellivision games, remaining anonymous is part of the deal. Mattel Toys that owned Mattel Electronics didn't want the programmers to be known, didn't want our names out there because they were afraid that Atari or Activision, one of the other companies, would steal us away. So everything had to be anonymous. They wanted to hide our names. In-house, I was fighting to get credit for my people actually on the boxes. But what they actually wanted to do is they wanted to hide who we were so the competition would not recruit us away. 
And every good secret organization needs a good alias. We did a, an interview with TV Guide in 1982, and they sent a gentleman named Howard Polskin to interview us, but Howard Polskin was told, you have to change their names in the interview. And all of our names were changed, and the writer wanted some sort of a description, a group description for us, and we didn't have one really. You know, we were, we were application software at Mattel Electronics. <laughs> And application software didn't sound sexy. So the writer said, how about you guys call yourselves the Blue Sky Rangers? Because we talked about having Blue Sky Sessions. Because he heard that our brainstorming sessions were called Blue Sky Sessions. Where we'd try and think up new ideas or new ways to play games. And uh, the name took and it's stuck ever since. Blue Sky Rangers. And our vice president, Gabriel Baum, he didn't like that name. He said, I hate that, that's stupid. But the marketing people at Mattel, the publicity people at Mattel said, let's go with it, let's give them something. Let's give them something that gives them a hook to write the story. So how about instead of you guys call yourself the Blue Sky Rangers, he just says, you are the Blue Sky Rangers. And Gabriel said, ah, I guess I can live with that, you know, because yeah, okay, whatever. So since we knew Gabriel hated the name, we, of course, adopted it as our logo. Uh, I designed the logo for the Blue Sky Rangers. I put his face on it. In the article, they changed his name to Hal, so we have in Hal we trust around this logo. And that became the generic name for those of us who worked on games at Mattel. And as the years go by at Mattel, some of the Blue Rangers begin to move on. When the industry started, it was very strange because now we were getting paid to do what we loved. And we would look at each other and we'd go, what happens if they find out we do this for free? The, the best description that anybody ever did of what it was like to program at Mattel was that it was, it was like living in a college dorm. There was always people there, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you could walk in there at Sunday morning, 3 a.m., shout out, hey, anybody here? And somebody would pop up from a cubicle, yeah, I'm working. Most of them were single. Just about everybody was under 25. Uh, so there was a lot of socializing together. A lot of people became roommates. The relationship started and broke up. It was, so it was a very intense time, not only professionally, but also socially with this group of people. And everything was such a frontier because there wasn't a large body of existing games. So if you got an idea, it was easy to have an idea that was new that had never been done before. But despite more powerful hardware, better graphics, and a talented staff, the Intellivision sales still fall short when compared to Atari's. Television at first was competition. Unfortunately, that's all they have were sports games that look really nice. But most of the game were two-player games, nothing that was really solitaire. And Atari had all these arcade games. Is that everything? It's not everything. You can get nearly 300 different copies. 300. And eventually, Mattel started releasing some arcade games, but they didn't have the licenses that Atari had. And television's arcade games were slower than Atari's. So eventually, Atari won in, in that battle. Atari was the main player. Atari probably outnumbered all the other uh, companies by probably four to one, but that's off the top of my head. Discover a world beyond your wildest dream. It becomes clear that dethroning Atari isn't going to be easy. So in 1983, Intellivision plans another attack and releases Intellivision 2. There are even plans for an Intellivision 3, but the blueprints are scrapped when the competition becomes too much. Over 430 games. The problem was there was just too much product out there. You have dozens and dozens of software companies releasing garbage. And of course, as, as more and more companies got in, there was more and more games supply and uh, just not enough demand to, to support that much. There was too much product for store shelves. They had to start being marked down. Most of those games wound up being sold at 2 and $3 a piece at, uh, at discounters. And here we are coming out with 30 or $40 products. No matter how good a game was, it was very difficult to sell a game for $30, $40 when you could go in for $30, $40 and get 15 games, even if they were all terrible. And Johnny's dad goes in at Christmas and he can buy him eight cartridges or he can buy him one cartridge. And he says, well, I don't know the difference. I'll buy him these eight that are in the front bin and wrap up more gifts for Christmas. And ours that were still frontline good products didn't sell. You have these third party companies can't sell their stuff, they're going out of business. 
Unlike the industry today, a third-party publisher who publishes a PlayStation game, Sony gets a cut of it. Back in 1983, if Activision did an Intellivision game, Mattel didn't get anything from it. What do they do? They dump all their goods at cutthroat prices. Now you can get games for $5. It, it, it was a very difficult paradigm for them to beat. And things are about to go from bad to worse. It was really the d demise of the business, and, and we unfortunately didn't see it coming. By 1983, store shelves are overflowing with second-rate games, prices are falling, and the industry is totally freaking out. A lot of people just got burned. They just got tired of getting all these bad games. So that drove people away from video games. And there were no checks and balances for quality in those days. So a lot of really bad games got out there in the early 80s. And so the whole thing collapsed. But even as everything crumbles around them, the Intellivision manages to stay on the shelves. When the video game industry collapsed in 83 and everybody got out of it in 84, Intellivision survived. Intellivision was the one game system that kept going. To keep the Intellivision selling, a bold move is made. The senior vice president of marketing for, Mel for Mattel Electronics, Terry Valesky, looked at the numbers and said, there's still a demand out there for video games. Everybody's getting out of it, but people still want to play video games. So he put together a group of investors. They bought the rights to Intellivision from Mattel. INTV is formed, and the Intellivision lives on. The console that dared to challenge Atari's dominance ends up outliving it. They continued to make the consoles, they continued to make new games from 1984 through 1990. The company actually lasted till 1991. So Intellivision went through the entire decade of the 80s, which no other system did. I mean, Intellivision at the end was competing on the shelves with Sega. And of course, Nintendo and The steam eventually runs out, and INTV closes its doors in 1990. But Keith Robinson manages to buy the rights to all things in television and keeps the legacy alive. He also becomes the unofficial record keeper. As in television was going out of business, at Mattel Electronics was going out of business, I like took all of the files. As people were being laid off, I said, I'm going to write a book about this. And so they gave me their personal files and they gave me all this stuff. And so I had amassed like three file cabinets full of material saying, okay, great, I'm going to write this book. But then, like I say, Intellivision didn't die, continued to work on it. And he directs his creative juices into another medium. In 94, I got really enthralled by the World Wide Web. I start setting up a website. I'll take some of this material that I was going to write a book. I'll put it on the web, see if anybody's interested in that. And the public reacts. And a thousand people a week were coming to read about in television. And pretty soon I go, maybe there's still an interest in Intellivision. Uh, people kept emailing us and saying, is there a way to play these games on a PC or Mac? So Keith gives the public what they want, and Intellivision Lives is born. So myself, Steve Roney, who was another programmer uh, at Mattel, we bought the rights back. So we bought the rights to Intellivision, all the games, uh, put together a product, Intellivision Lives, which lets you play most of the old games from Mattel Electronics, from INTV Corporation on the PC and Mac. The Intellivision Lives CD becomes more than just a collection of games. It becomes a part of history. Put it out there for sale on the web and have done real well. And there's a, been a huge interest in the games. And we're just trying to recreate that whole experience of what it felt like to be working on those games. They've come to the GDC pretty much every year to kind of keep the history of you know, these old game systems alive and keep the roots of where industries come from on center stage. And I think that is important for us as an industry not to forget where we came from. First of all, for a lot of people, it was part of their childhood. 
is there's that special bond, childhood, I think it's something you played and enjoyed, especially if it's something you played with your brother or your sister or your friend. Well, I think it's nostalgia, you know? For me, they all remind me of, of you know, what it was like to be a kid, you know? And how pure everything was kind of back then, you know? And I think that what we see today with the PS2 and the Xbox, I mean, some kids are playing that now, and 20 years from now, they're like, oh, do you remember the days, you know? There's always a, do you remember the day kind of story? Do you remember this game or, you know? And it's just a part of the social fabric of life. The reason why Intellivision survived the crash in 83 was because it had loyal fans. Thanks to a renewed interest in classic gaming and to those who refused to let it go, Intellivision literally lives on. They were games which were really handcrafted because we had a few months, one programmer, one game. You had a chance to really work on and polish your game. It's a very individual experience. One person was in charge of the whole thing, and the games were small, and it was just a thrill to work on. But perhaps the biggest testament to the true success of the Intellivision lies in the people who were there when it all began. We get together, and we still swap stories. And every year, somebody new that we didn't know or hasn't been to the one of the reunions shows up, and we get to include them. So the Blue Sky Rangers keeps growing. We still, 20 years later, we have reunions at a certain pizza parlor in Hawthorne, California, where the gang used to go. Sometimes in Northern California, there will be a satellite reunion. But after 20 years, a lot of us are still friends, we still are together, we still see each other all the time. A lot of us have worked together off and on during the years. And we just have a great time getting together because we have that common experience that transcended everything in our lives. When it comes to space games, nobody compares to Atari. Excuse me, have you compared them to Intellivision? Intellivision? Sure, they've got great space games, like Intellivision Space Battle. I didn't know. And now there's Space Armada and the incredible Astro Smash. I didn't know. Here, compare for yourself. Intellivision Space Games from Mattel Electronics. Once you compare, you'll know.